Hello, I'm John Haskell, director of the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. Thank you for joining us. Today, we have a conversation featuring the research of library staff member Megan Halsband, who was a 2020 recipient of the prestigious Kluge Staff Fellowship. The fellowship is an opportunity for library staff to take six months away from their day job to dig more deeply in their specialty. Megan's project during the fellowship was Peculiar Pop, Genre Comic Books at the Library of Congress. Megan works in the Serials and Publications Division at the library. Shortly after graduating from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2008 with master's degrees in art history and library science, Megan began working with the library's comic book collection. She helped establish the library's comic-related web archive collection and is passionate about bringing the collection to new audiences. She is joined by a former distinguished visiting scholar at the Kluge Center, Jesse J. Holland. While at Kluge, Jesse researched the social history of the Freedmen's Village once located on the site of Arlington Cemetery. Jesse's a host of the Saturday edition of C-SPAN's Washington Journal and can be seen weekly as a political analyst on the Black News Channel's DC Live. He was a longtime reporter for the Associated Press. He covered the White House, the Supreme Court, and the Congress, and also wrote on race and ethnicity issues. During his two decades in the nation's capital for AP, he was one of the few reporters to be a credentialed member of all three members of the major Washington press corps. He's the author and editor of the new Black Panther Tales of Wakanda prose anthology, which was released this February from Titan Books and Marvel. This was the first prose anthology featuring the first mainstream Black superhero. Among many other publications, Jesse is the author of The Black Panther, Who is the Black Panther? which was nominated for an NAACP Image Award in 2019. He also wrote The Invisibles, The Untold Story of African-American Slavery Inside the White House, which was named as the 2017 Silver Medal Award winner in US history in the Independent Publisher Book Awards, and also one of the top history books of 2016 by smithsonian.com. At this point, let me turn the program over to you, Jesse. It's great to be here with you, Megan. As anyone who knows me can tell you, I am a huge comic book fan, and I was so pleased to know that I would have a chance to sit down and talk with you about the Library of Congress collection. So first thing I need to know, Megan, as a comic book fan myself, when did you first become interested in comic books? Well, so my story is not that interesting. Um... I sort of fell into this a little bit. Uh, I did read a few different comics when I was a kid. Uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and wrestling comics are the two that really spring to mind, uh, mostly because my, that's what my cousins read and they were my best friends. But uh, before I started my position uh, in serials, I didn't really have too much of a background in comic books, which is both good and bad for this job, I think, right? Because I don't have any particular favorites. I don't um, have, you know, a direction that I feel like the library should be going. At the same time, there are often people who know a lot more about comic books than I do, but it's actually kind of fun. So um, I... I have a long time interest in the ephemeral, however. And so that's kind of where I see the tie in between comic books and my own background. Explain to us what you mean by that. What do you mean by that you have an interest in the ephemeral? So my master's theses were on stereographs, which for those of you who don't know them are the 19th century precursor to the Viewmaster, where uh, it was a photographic card with two photos and you looked through a device and it was a three-dimensional representation of whatever was on the card. And so uh, I wrote extensively about those materials and they're considered pop culture sort of uh, throwaway material, uh, much like kind of comic books have frequently been considered over the course of their lifetime. So that's kind of what I mean by ephemeral. So you're spending all of this time with the comic book collection at the Library of Congress. Now, do you 
buy them yourself now? Are you a collector now? Have we brought you over to the dark side of comic book collecting? I buy some, uh, particularly when I go to the Small Press Expo uh, here in Bethesda uh, in the DC region. I, I will buy some if they are, particularly speak to me, if they're sort of strange and quirky uh, often or food related. Uh, I do have a small collection of graphic novels, um, a small collection of other comic books, but for the most part, I try to leave the collecting to the library, which is, you know, the thing I'm supposed to do professionally. Now, I can actually hear some people out there saying right now, what in the world is the Library of Congress doing collecting comic books in the first place? The Library of Congress is supposed to be for important literature, and I can just hear the minds of some of the unwashed, uneducated people out there saying that comic books are not important literature. So what is the importance of having this collection at the Library of Congress? Why is the Library of Congress even collecting comic books? Well, so first of all, I want to say the library has been collecting comic books basically since they started to exist as we know them in the 1930s. Um, the library acquires a lot of its materials through the U.S. Copyright Office, uh, and I can explain more about that later. But the library is not in the business of assigning value to what people may or may not want to remember about American culture and about international culture. We are tasked with representing American creativity and knowledge. And part of that is comic books. And for people who would still argue about their lack of value uh, or their lack of importance to American culture, I would invite them to look at any bestseller list or movie list in the last, I don't know, 40 years or so. It, I have other opinions about that, but I think we're going to get into those later. <laughs> well, I mean, where do comic books fit into American literature and entertainment? Because I know we consider the uh, book format to right. be one of the most important formats. And now movies and television, they've become the most popular form. Where do comic books fit? Everywhere. I'm the... <laughs> I know that's sort of a glib answer. So comics have their history in illustrated books. And, you know, there's many things written about their precedence in illustrated um, magazines and in actually printmaking and um, print culture from the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. So, you know, the, the idea that they're less than uh, is sort of a misnomer because that's assuming that everybody feels like the definition of literature means that it's valuable. Um, and I think that depending on the time period will determine what you think is valuable. And so, um, you know, for the Library of Congress, we want to preserve every format and every type of material because the importance of that material won't necessarily be known in our lifetimes. Uh, and so I don't think that, uh, you know, anybody thought some of the most famous drawings by some of the most famous painters were all that important uh, back, you know, 400 years ago, but now we think they're extremely important. And so who am I to say that comic books won't be that in another 200 years? Right. Well, some of us think comic books are very, very important right now, it's but, true. but we'll, we'll, we'll just let that slide for the moment. Now, when I was growing up, many people considered comic books to be solely for children. Who are comic books for? Are they still just for children? Have they ever been just for children? I'd say no. That's my, that's my opinion. Um, I think other people would disagree with me. Um, it's a much debated uh, topic, as you know. Um, but I don't think they've ever really completely been for children. I think they've been for everyone uh, from the beginning, because if you look back at some of the, um, you know, the precedents and the history of 
things that influenced what we now know of as comics today, it was really for adults. Um, you know, people consider some of some early illustrated books and, um, you know, illustrated serialized paintings, um, you know, to be for adults. And so uh, the, the comic books that first appeared on the market were very much influenced by adult literature, pulp fiction, um, science fiction from the 20s. And so, you know, I don't, I think it's sort of a misnomer because of the, some of the marketing that initially happened, you know, in the late 1930s, but people forget about all of the detective comics and um, horror comics and, you know, true life comics that were published that really were not for kids uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Well, I will tell you that one of the most valuable comic books I have in my collection is the Montgomery story, which was a comic book that I actually had given, that was actually given to me by former representative John Lewis, which was the comic yeah. that inspired him yeah. to get into the civil rights movement. So I know that these comic books can be very important and yeah. they can be important to society as well. Yeah, well, so that's a really interesting question because, um, you know, that's actually something that I'm particularly interested in as far as the library's collection goes are some of those um, more historically oriented or um, social justice oriented materials, I guess, if you want to phrase it that way. But, you know, things that are not necessarily traditional superheroes and because i think those are really important to make sure that they're represented as well because everybody knows about superheroes but less people know about the montgomery story and i'm hoping that you know at some point that isn't that that isn't quite as wide of a gap maybe well, let's talk a little bit about the specific collection at the Library of Congress. Can you tell us exactly what the Library of Congress is collecting? How many comic books are there in this collection and what type of comic books are there? We have everything represented. We don't have everything ever published. That's a misnomer that a lot of people think about the library is that we have every book ever published. We don't, unfortunately. Um, the we have everything from some of the earliest materials that were actually uh, reprints of newspaper comic strips to issues of Ms. Marvel from 2019, 2020. Uh, there's a bit of a backlog on current stuff because of the way that it comes into the library. Uh, we don't have a direct subscription, so you, it's not exactly like what people do when they go and pick up their order at their comics shop on a Wednesday. But eventually those all come into the library's collection and are cataloged. And so one of the things that I do is to do research and work with uh, people using the collection to see what we don't have and then acquire that material for the collection because it's been requested, because we think it's important. Um, you know, for a variety of reasons. And so that kind of goes to, you know, how do we get stuff? And, uh, but the copyright office is really one of the major ways we get a large portion of the collection. We would not be able to have such a large collection if it were not for the copyright office. So that's really amazing. And at the same time, we don't get everything through the copyright office. So we have agreements with, um, places like the Small Press Expo to collect independently published materials. We accept gifts and donations, uh, and we do have a small budget to go and purchase uh, materials for the collection that are significant uh, in some way, shape, or form, either to the history of comics or to you know, research or to another collection at the library. Now, I know many people out there will understand going out and hunting down comic books that you're missing from your collection. But explain to us exactly what the Copyright Office has to do with it. How do they work with the Library of Congress and why are they even in the process? Well, uh, so copyright law as we know it 
has changed quite a bit. But one of the main constants is that U.S. publishers are required by law to submit copies of their materials to the U.S. Copyright Office for registration. And the Copyright Office makes that material available to the library for our permanent collections. So it's not just comic books. It's movies, it's TV shows, it's recorded sound, it's newspapers, it's books, it's all of the things that you can think of that are being published today, including websites and online content. And so uh, comic books are just one part of, of that. But, you know, from my perspective, they're a big part of what we get from the library, from the, uh, excuse me, the copyright office. So not every creator or publisher knows that they're supposed to be depositing for U.S. copyright, however. So therein lies one of the gaps that we've identified where we go out and collect material that we don't get through the Copyright Office. Um, and people will be familiar when I say the big two. Uh, that's mostly what we get, DC and Marvel materials uh, through copyright. So smaller publishers and mini comics and other things like that is what we, what we go out and collect ourselves. Now we get to my part, which is the collecting Jones. What is actually in this collection? What's the <laughs> oldest one you have? What's the most valuable one you have? What's the most significant find? Come on, you tell us what's there. <laughs> well, so again, my answer is it's gonna be depends on how you define all of those things. Uh, you know, so we have some early work by um, Rodolf Toffler. I'm not pronouncing that name correctly in various circles he's kind of considered the person who first authored a comic book um the in the u.s it was published as the adventures of obadiah old book um you know some people consider william hogarth's rake's progress as the first comic so the oldest comic will depend on how you define that and who you ask uh the library has copies of materials from Rodolf Toffler, who's uh, considered by some to be one of the first comic book artists from the 1830s and 1840s. Uh, his US publication, The Adventures of Obadiah Oldbuck is quoted in various places as being the earliest comic book. The, the earliest comic book as kind of we know it is Famous Funnies, um, which what it looks like what we now know as a comic book it's you know about seven by ten six by nine uh it's it was published monthly uh and it had various comic strips in it that were actually all reprints from newspapers the you know so that doesn't really answer your question, but th those, you know, so we, it depends on how you, you determine what's the oldest. Same thing for what you, how you determine what's the most valuable. Are we talking what's worth the most money or what's worth the most historically? Um, so one of the things that people are always horrified by when I talk to them about what we buy for the collection is that we crack open CGC and other graded comics uh, so that they can be available for reading. Uh, and so the library, we could purchase or be given extremely valuable comics that are in enclosed in a case, which increases their value. We will uh, actually make them less valuable so that by cracking that open so that we can then provide access to it. Um, so, you know, monetarily speaking, I don't really know if I have an answer to that. Um, you know, we have, we don't have a copy of Action Number One, which is considered the most valuable comic, like, ever. Um, if anybody is willing to donate one to us, though, we will gladly add that to our collection. Um, I think the last one sold for like what three point five million dollars or something like that. Yeah, it's not that I don't have that kind of budget. Um, 
you know, we have Batman number one, we have Amazing Fantasy 15, we have, um, trying to think of the first appearance of Thor, uh, you know, so it, it, we have lots of valuable things. Um, for me, the most valuable thing or item that we have in the collection is probably either is our copy of ne all Negro comics, which is, um, from 1947 and was the first comic book published by African-American authors and artists in the US. Uh, and so, and I believe our copy is the copyright deposit copy. So there's only one copy that was ever published. There's only a handful that are known to exist. And it's a significant piece of comics history. And so for me, that's probably the most valuable comic, uh, personally, I think it really depends on who you ask, though, because everybody nerds out about something different. Right. Well, that, that reminds me that I need to come see that copy so I can read yes. about Ace Harlem and Lion Man and all of the other great characters in there. Yes. Brings up the question, actually two questions here. A, how is the Library of Congress preserving these comic books? And B, if someone walks into the Library of Congress and wants to see some of these great comic books, can they? Yes, and yes. Um, so we actually the we actually uh, worked with our preservation section to um, formulate enclosures, which are now sold commercially. They're an acid-free envelope that's tailored to the size, and they have a um, polyester window that allows you to see the cover. And so each comic book is barcoded and cataloged individually, and then we store them in manuscript boxes in our vault. And so it's in a temperature controlled environment. And, um, you know, we have individual records for each comic book. And so, you know, comic books themselves um, were not meant to last. And, you know, what we're doing is trying to help extend their life you know, they, the, the paper has what conservators call inherent vice. Uh, it is destroying itself because of its very nature. It was acidic, cheap newsprint paper that was meant to be cheaply printed and cheaply sold. And so it's not the same quality as the rag paper of made out of cotton from the 1700s. We do what we can. Um, and part of that preservation uh, effort means that when surrogates are available for certain comics, we will serve the surrogate unless there's a significant research purpose to serving the original. That being said, for most of the collection, people can register for a reader card at the Library of Congress and come to my reading room, the newspaper and current periodical reading room, and request materials. It's all by request. Um, but certainly the reference staff can help you figure out what you might want to make a request for. Um, at the moment, the collection is only open by appointment because all of the reading rooms at the library are only open by appointment. We'll see what happens in the next six months or so. Uh, but certainly anybody can get in touch with us uh, to make an appointment. If you're over the age of 16, you can register for a reader card and come in and read read comics it's i mean what's what, better what, than what more could you ask for just to come yeah. into the beautiful library of congress building and sit there and read comics now let's talk a little bit about the project you're working on for the kluge center i mean the kluge center obviously is a great place tell us what this project is so my initial proposal was to uh work on a book to be published uh, in conjunction with the library's publishing office about non-superhero comics. So technically superhero comics themselves are a genre, um, but the way that I framed the proposal was that I would look at uh, underused subjects. So romance, horror, Westerns, uh, 
educational comics, uh, those kinds of things. And so the intent of the book was to feature materials from our collection, as well as materials from across the library to kind of provide context for, uh, for those specific comics and uh, to highlight a particular subject by within a chapter. So romance had it has its own chapter and Westerns has its own chapter. And so um, the, the amazing and also sort of awful thing about doing research at the Kluge is you find so many things that you didn't know existed before. And so I ended up writing a book chapter as well as uh, identifying a new unprocessed collection during my research time. And so um, hope, I'm hoping that out of that, in addition to the book that I initially proposed, there will be a book chapter um, kind of talking about the significance of comics in special collections and then a um, an additionally accessible or more known collection of zines and mini comics from the Frederick Wortham Library that's at the Library of Congress. So stay tuned on that. <laughs> So for the few people out there who don't know anything about comics, and I know there's got to be a couple people left who still don't know anything about comics. What's the difference between a comic book, a, a zine, and a mini comic? Yes. Uh, comic. So comic books are kind of the way that the library defines them are the, you know, 16 to 32 page floppies that you get at the comic book shop that are parts of stories that get published every month or every other month, um, you know, that are often the ongoing series like Superman or Spider-Man. Mini comics uh, tend to be materials that are published according to the library's definition independently, and they tend to be much smaller. So often like this, although we have mini comics that are much larger in size, they're tabloid, um, the mini comics for the library tend to be non-superhero materials, although again, like making that generalization is doesn't really work uh, because many comics cover everything. The main thing is that they're they're published in limited runs usually, and often self-published or published by very small publishers. Um, and so, and then zines, um, again, from the library's perspective. Uh, are more word-based than image-based. And so uh, the zine and the mini comics collection at the library really overlaps. And I see a lot of connections and I actually work with other librarians to help build the zine collection. Um, but the mini comics themselves are zines that are more image focused. It's one way of defining them too. Now, one of the things you said earlier was that in your project, you weren't focusing as much on superhero comics. You were focusing on other areas. But for anyone who's following entertainment, yeah. superhero comics seem to be ruling the world. They do. What's the importance of these other genres? Why do we need to focus on those right now? Well, I think the popularity of comic subjects ebbs and flows. A lot of people forget that between about mm, 19, late 1940s and the early 1960s, superheroes did not rule the comic book market. Uh, Westerns, romances, uh, science fiction, those were what was super popular uh, for over a decade. Uh, and so even though, you know, superheroes have taken up a much longer chunk of, of the, of comic book history, you know, it, it really does ebb and flow. And so if you think about it, you know, in the early 2000s, um, the, Superheroes were still popular, but one of the most popular comic books is uh, Walking Dead from that time period. And, and that is definitely not a superhero comic. And so, you know, one of the things that I think um, these can show us is just kind of, you know, the interests of the time period and, you know, really reflect what was going on um, and what people were thinking about, you know, because even though 
they were for entertainment purposes, they were still intended to be sold. So publishers were looking, were looking to publish what they thought would sell. And, you know, Westerns, for example, uh, were extremely popular in television. And so there were many, many, many comic series that were tied to those television series, but also that capitalized on the interest in Westerns. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion on why that was of interest in the 1950s. Um, that's another conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so do these comic books tell us anything about the era in which they were printed? Are they a reflection of this society in which yes. they came about it? Yes, sorry, you're articulating that much better than I am. Um, you know, the so one of the one of the most interesting comics that I have uh, recently acquired is something called Seeing Washington, which was basically a tourist guide in comic book format from the '50s that uh, was sold to to promote Washington, visiting Washington, DC. Uh, and I'll give a shout out to the Library of Congress because we actually make it into uh, that comic book. Um, but, you know, the it what's represented in that comic book tells you what was important at the time or what people thought was important at the time about coming to DC. And so even though that particular comic isn't, you know, fiction, uh, I think the same sort of logic applies to fictional comics as well. You know, what were some of the storylines that were being published at the time? What was, you know, what was, what were people thinking about and talking about? Did it reflect, you know, kind of uh, issues about nuclear war? Um, did it reflect issues about uh, moral values? Some of those other things that I think are, a little bit harder to directly tease out, but when you think about it a little bit more, they're there and uh, they're kind of just waiting for somebody to talk about a little bit more. So tell us about some of the interesting finds that you've seen in the collection. You know, we've talked about some of the Wortham stuff. We've talked about some of the historically important stuff. What just some of the, are some of the other interesting things that you've come across? So, some of the most interesting finds. Uh, well, that seeing Washington one was pretty fun uh, to get. You know, the there are so many strange and wonderful comic books that have come up that I found it's really hard to uh, to pick just one. You know, one of the um, or even like you know ten. Uh, one of the things, one of the pieces that I've loved that we've gotten recently, well, not really recently, actually, it was about a decade ago, but library time is relative. Uh, we received a preview copy of uh, Congressman Lewis's March from the publisher. It was, uh, there was a little preview mini comic that was handed out at the Small Press Expo in 2011, 2012, and it had a different cover. And so that's part of our Small Press Expo collection. And then we have the published copy of Congressman Lewis's book that he actually signed. And so something that I've done in the past is pull out both of those and show them to people. And I think that that's one of the really interesting and amazing things that you can do at the library is you can see and then pull out also a copy of Martin Luther King and the Montgomery story and see the comic book that inspired this you know, award-winning graphic novel. And so that's one of my favorite things to do is to find uh, items in the collection that pair with other things across the library and show people, you know, kind of the richness of the library, but also the just breadth of the collection. Um, the, you know, the Wortham zines have been one that have been really interesting. Um, let's see. Uh, I recently bought a first appear the first appearance of the Flash in Showcase um, for the library's collection. I think that's 1956. Okay, so now I'm going to go geek on you. Are, you. are you talking about the Barry Allen Flash or the Jay Garrick Flash? Uh, I believe Barry <laughs> Allen, so Silver Age. Yeah, Okay. Silver Age. Um, the, you know, one of the things that sort of really determines what we can buy for the collection is what's actually available. And, you know, sometimes there's just not 
anything available for what we're looking for. Um, you know, there's, cause there's only six copies known to exist in the entire world. Uh, but it, it can be kind of a fun treasure hunt to go and see what's out there sometimes. Um, you know, it often ends up being very random, um, but can be pretty exciting. Uh, you know, probably the item that I feel like is the most significant that I've acquired uh, or helped acquire, um, rather, is uh, our set of Negro Romance. Uh, so we bought the first issue because a researcher actually specifically asked for it. And no other library at the time had owned it. And I went out and searched and found a copy for sale and didn't really know the significance of that particular comic at the time. Um, we now have a full set. We have all four issues that were published uh, between approximately 1950 and 1955. And it's one of the few comic books from before, you know, honestly, the Black Panther was published and, you know, from before the 1970s where there were positive depictions of African-American and Black characters in comics that weren't stereotyped, that weren't, um, you know, negative. And so at the time I was responding to a research request and little did I know how, how important it would be later on. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of one of the amazing things about the library uh, is being able to work with materials like that. Um, that's, that's one of the best parts of my job. So for the, the collectors who are out there watching this now, if they wanted to donate their collection to the Library of Congress, what are, are, are is there anything, in, is there anything in particular you're looking for right now? And if somebody wanted to donate their comic book collection to the Library of Congress, how would they do that? You would get in touch with us and we'd talk more and talk about what you had. You know, it's, we don't have complete runs of, of everything. So, you know, we, we might have issues number 30 through 50 of Wonder Woman, but we don't have 55 through 62. So that would be on our list. Uh, you know, we might not have some of the early 80s strange eclipse publications. Um, I know for a fact, we don't have a lot of original issues of Love and Rockets. So, you know, it can really vary widely. And so I think, you know, if if anybody is at all interested in, you know, donating their collection or talking to us about their collection, um, there's a lot of opportunities uh, that we, we need materials for at the library, if that makes sense. So as we wrap up here, what is your overarching goal for this project you're working on? Are you trying to make comics more popular? Are you trying to make sure that issues aren't forgotten? Tell us what you see as your end goal here. Well, so I don't think comics need my help to be more popular. <laughs> the one thing that does need my help to be more popular and more visible is the library's collection. And so I think like that's the ultimate highest level goal, you know, getting a book published or publishing blog posts, even this interview or sort of icing on the cake. Um, I think really, you know, I want more people to know about the collection and for it to be more regularly used both by library staff and by people coming to use the library's collections so that, you know, somebody can come who's writing a book and read some of those original issues and then incorporate that, that subject or that those characters into their work of fiction or their, um, you know, historical investigation of a particular artist um, or a particular series. And so I think that there's a lot of potential there that's untapped. And I just, I, that is, that is sort of my ultimate end goal is to make sure that, that we keep telling people about the collection and then it gets used. 
Well, Megan, I can tell you that I'll be making my appointment very soon because, you know, there's more than 160,000 comic books in that collection, which means I got a lot of reading to do to catch up on. There's a lot. Megan, thank you so much for this great conversation. Keep thank doing you, Jesse. work and we, you, we will see each other soon because I got a lot of comic book reading to do. Yes, we will. Thank you so much. Thanks.